the goal of this week is simply to help us think about if conflict begins at the heart level and the heart transformation is the crucial, uh, the crucial game for, for dealing with conflict, handling conflict within a relationship, then today I want to kind of help you think about how to uh, reframe the, your desires and your thoughts and your actions within the work of Jesus Christ. Because I really think that um, if, if I'm saying the center of your conflict is unfulfilled desires and we run past it, uh, the, the satisfaction of our desires and the confidence we have putting it in Christ, then we'll really be just putting uh, a, a Band-Aid on the, the symptoms. The, the core of your conflict comes from your faith in the Lord Jesus or lack thereof, unbelief, right? And I, I just felt like it was way too big a deal for me to bypass. If you're from Resurrection Church, some of this may be reminder, but I took some time to try and think about it and illustrate it in a way that would be helpful. So your PDF specifically has two pictures that I'm going to be interacting with as we look at passages. Because, um, because we're really, all we're going to work through is how do we apply the gospel to our own hearts and then work through it with our spouse tonight so that we can, we can get to the heart of the issue, which is really driving the tongue anyway in our communication. The heart of the issue, our heart, is where, where the whole battle is. So what I'd like to do is give us a framework for thinking about our old way of life and understanding the way of life we inherited is the way I describe it. And that's the way of life that we see the world through in, in our normal position as people separate from God. So the first picture I've drawn for you, I'll explain it for you, but I'm going to explain it from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. So if you would turn to Titus chapter 2, I'm going to actually, I'll have Abby read that. And, uh, and then I'll draw on that passage as one of the touchstones. You can also put your finger in Ephesians chapter 4. Go ahead and read Titus 2, babe. All right. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So I think that one of the things that in this passage is the, a crucial idea that is, is easily forgotten is that the gospel teaches us a certain way to see the world and live in the world. And often people think about the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ, his life, death, burial, resurrection, as, as kind of the ABCs of the Christian life when actually the scripture presents it as the transformation, transforming lens through which we see the entire world. So I want to read you another passage, Ephesians chapter 4, and show you uh, Paul's description of life without Christ first. He says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. Okay, so pause there. If you look at your, you look at your picture, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to use this a little illustration, but you have it. And, and uh, is Nathan, I can see your face. So is, are the words backwards for you? They are forwards? Okay, good. So um, this is the fallen state. That's why I put them all in black. And this is the default state of the human heart and the human life, the worldview that we inherited. And what we have here is this crown represents God, these people, it's you and your marriage, right? And without, without any transformation, what happens is there's a separation because of sin between you and God, and then ultimately that leads to condemnation or punishment because of your sin. That's what this skull is. So you're kind of living in this lost box, right? And this lost box creates an atmosphere about how you see the world. Paul says that they were separated from the life of God in Ephesians chapter 4, that they were ignorant about how they see the world. 
it's dark inside the box, if I can say it that way, right? And that's why Paul says, on the other side, that the gospel teaches us to say no to the old way. The way Paul uses it in Titus is he says, ungodly, so living as if there's no God. Well, there's a barrier between you and God. There's a separation there that's partly because you want to be your own God, but also because he has separated himself from sinful people. And then worldly, living as if this line here, the world is all there is. You live from birth date to death date if you're an unbeliever. That's the way you see the world. All that matters is right here, right now in this life. And frankly, even baby Christians or sometimes mature Christians, there are ways in our lives where we still live this way. And so you think about um, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 32, when Paul's teaching the church on the resurrection, he says, um, if, I, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, and be merry, eat, drink, and for tomorrow we die. He says, hey, if there's no resurrection, then I should be living for between these dots, right? And that's why I've used three Fs, because it's kind of a memorable way to think about it. But when there is a break between God and I, then there is fear of God, but also fear in, in the sense of worry, anxiety, and lack of confidence about the future, because it's either I'm in hostility with God if we believe there's a God, or if I'm my own God, I don't have very much control, right? So, so I am fearful about the future. I am fearful about who's going to provide for me. I'm fearful about how am I going to make it. Now that turns into this, horizontal, this vertical line displays our relationship with God. And this vertical or horizontal line is describing our relationship with other humans, right? And so we, what we do when we're fearful, whether we either are running from God or trying to play God, both of those situations suck, right? So then what we do is we fight or we feast. And those are my words for conflict or indulgence, right? Paul says that they indulge because of the hardening of their hearts. They're darkened in their understanding. It makes, if there's no resurrection, let's eat and drink because tomorrow we die, right? If there's no resurrection, if there's nothing more than this life, then James chapter four, I, why does conflict cause up, come from you? It comes from unfulfilled desires. I don't have what I want, so I kill to get it. I slander to get it, right? This is the, the, the lost vantage point on the world, right? But if you look at um, Titus 2, which Abby read, what are the first words been? Can you read verse 11? Yep. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. So it teaches, well, sorry, the next, next words of verse 12 say, it teaches us to something. And Paul says in Ephesians 4, that, however, verse 20, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. See, I think a lot of times what we're doing is we're trying to figure out simple actions that we stop doing and start doing instead of thinking about how when the work of, that Jesus lived perfectly the way we couldn't, he died sacrificially in our place, he rose victoriously as our hope, it actually changes everything about the way we see the world. And, and so I put Jesus here between us and the Father, representing a, a no longer a barrier, but a right relationship with God. Instead of fear, there's a relationship of faith or trust, right? I trust what Jesus says and what he's done, right? what he's done to make me right with God and what he says enough to rule my life. And what he says, okay, I'm still living in a world that is broken by sin and awaiting for some of the full promises. And that's where this word hope comes in, a confident expectation of a world that, that things are on earth as they are in heaven. So I've, I've shown kind of a, a dream bubble of where our desires are resting. And that enables us, okay, to live here with new horizontal relationships, knowing that we're going to live somewhere forever, knowing that we're going to be satisfied somewhere forever. And so... I trust Jesus to have made me right with God. I'm no longer worried about who's going to provide for me. I am no longer, I'm no longer trying to run my own life. I trust Jesus enough to run my own life. That's faith, right? I listen to his promises and I expect I'm living for the future he's bringing. This is the best verse. This is where my hopes and dreams, my desires are set. And since ultimately this is where my desires are set, 
it teaches me to live differently. So, so let's use the language of Titus 2. It teaches me to say no to ungodly and worldly living. To, to When I see the way of life that says there's no God or this world is all there is, I turn away from that. Instead, I have self-controlled, upright, and godly living. Living that's submitted to God, living that's just toward my neighbor, and living that's controlled in my appetites. Because I'm not living for this life. I'm not living based on my own advice or perspective of the world. Ephesians chapter 4, that's not the way of life you learn in Christ from the truth you were taught in him. And he says, put off the old man and put on the new, being renewed in your mind, and walk in the way of love, even as Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us. I now have the ability to sacrifice, to be sacrificially committed for the good of another. And this is way, um, this is the dynamic you see throughout the scripture. And so I, I've given you an overview there, but I really want you to, the, the only assignment I've given is for you to take this idea and, and, and walk through a recent conflict or a recent sin struggle that you had and think about it in terms of these two pictures. All right, I'm actually going to use the same picture uh, or the different pictures side by side. Um, wait, is left to right? Is that the way it looks like a progress for you? Okay, good. Um, so the, the way of life we learned in Christ involves trusting what Jesus has done and trusting what Jesus says. Hope, then, because he gives us promises that are not yet seen, is I set my heart on the future Jesus is bringing. And love is I put God highest and I put the best interests of others first. So now I want you to think about the, uh, uh, a recent sin struggle. This could apply to anything personally, but specifically since we were talking about conflict within our marriage, okay? You think about a time when you were sinful towards your spouse uh, it, recently, maybe in the conflict that you were, just, you were doing in your exercise, right? And you're going to be able to see it at some level in line with uh, the, the breakdown either between the relationship between you and God, but often if it's conflict within your marriage, what you're seeing is a breakdown on this plane. You're failing, you're fighting, you're feasting, you're, you're indulgent at the expense of others, or you're aggressively trying to get what you want even though it costs, goes through others. So you have some kind of misaligned love that usually is a warning sign. Am I putting God highest or the best interest of my spouse first? Well, when I just cussed her out, the answer would be no, right? When I just did whatever it was, uh, I decided I knew she needed help with something, and I just decided to pretend that I didn't even notice because I just wanted to do my thing on my phone or whatever. That is not putting her best interest first, and I can then see, oh, that's because... There's some misalignment at the level of belief. The fundamental work of the Christian is not to try harder, but it's actually to believe more deeply the work and sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I always find helpful is when I take time, this is the thing, it's like um, it's like ride, our daughters are learning to ride a bike right now. Actually, she's, she's learned now. She can ride a bike without training wheels, right? But it's very painstaking for the first many days where she is trying to think about the, the launch of putting her foot on the pedal. She's trying to think about the next pedal. She's trying to think about keeping things steady. As a believer, it's going to not come second nature. It's not going to become natural for you to unpack the, the way your heart is seeing the world and then apply the gospel the truth about Jesus Christ and the way he shapes the world at first. And so it may take time. In fact, it may even mean that you require space at times to think through it uh, formally. And then as you become more well-versed in the way you see the world, just like anything else, it's going to become more natural that you kind of say, oh, I'm picking up on places where I'm starting to see like the new man. This is actually the way I see the world. And when this pops up, I can catch it. Excuse me. This pops up, I can catch it, right? Right now, what you're probably going to be doing is saying, oh, man, there's so much to unpack. I'm not sure. But I'd be looking for places where you say, okay, if I have a breakdown in love, I haven't put my spouse in best interest ahead of my own. That is coming up from a root. That is fruit. 
right? And I am trying to usually, like James says, conflict comes from unfulfilled desires. So if I have a misaligned love, what is the false hope? What is the desire that I believe is unfulfilled or won't be fulfilled for me by God that I need to get for myself? The way I've written it for, I think for you is, what am I desiring that I believe God will not provide or I believe others are keeping from me or me from, right? I was counseling a young man uh, yesterday. And the way I helped him think about it was this. When my, when my hands close, that's a very good visible symbol that I am not, I am not hoping in, confidently expecting God to provide for me. So guys when, or girls, when your fists close in anger, that is a great sign that you're trying to fight to get what you want, the old way of living, right? When you feel yourself clutching, that feasting, no, I've got to indulge myself. I've got to keep for me. That's a place where you can see right away. I don't make fists when I feel safe. I don't make fists when I feel satisfied. I don't make fists when I feel provided for. And that's why we say these, the breakdown, right? When I know the Heavenly Father loves me and that there, there is nothing that I, he, he will protect me, he will provide for me. Well, then I have the freedom to open my palms. I have the freedom to give generously. I have the freedom to wait patiently. I have the freedom, those false hopes where I say, I've got to go get this for me. And I, I don't know what, what you um, think of when I describe that, but that's an important way for us to look for those warnings. And I, I, I think I've told you about anger where I would see Abby turn her back on me and I would physically feel like the blood rush through my veins. And, and there was this misaligned love that I, was, that I didn't realize I had, but I was not putting her best interest ahead of my own. My hope and desire to be honored as the grand poobah of whatever, at least to be listened to by my wife, was, was flaring up in, within me. My reputation was at stake. And it was because I, uh, yeah, you know, I began to realize was, oh, I'm seeing this breakdown of love and I have to trace it back to the root of a misaligned hope, which is based on, okay, it's based on who do I put my confidence in, my trust. The promise is, who do I promise? Who's going to follow through on their promises? Unbelief. What have I forgotten about God? Or what lie have I begun to believe about God? So I ask those things. And then I have to actively embrace the work of Jesus Christ and his person. Okay. And this, I, I know I'm spending most of my time here, but I, I really, this is crucial. Okay, because we have to then take and put off the old man and put on the new. So in faith, right, because it starts with renewing our mind. It starts with the truth of God's word. How does Jesus and his work answer my unbelief? All right, so I have my reputation at, in jeopardy. Well, think about the cross and think about the two sides of that coin where the cross shows something pretty clear about the condemnation I deserve, but also think about the way that Christ has taken my shame and clothed me with the status of his righteousness, right? What am I trying to get from Abby when I've already been given, granted the status as a righteous son of the heavenly father and my future is guaranteed to be, to be clothed in glory? Glorification is, is Romans 8, right? What am I trying to get for myself? Or how, how will the work of Jesus give me confidence that influences my desires? Maybe some of you feel like, you know what, um, the person I was working with yesterday, they're, they're, they're being mistreated at times. And, you know, what their, their fists were clutching together in, in a sense of a desire for justice. And injustice is being done, and they've got to, they've got to make a fist and fight their way to being treated rightly, right? Well, that, that directly hinges on the work of God and in, in his promises in the future. Well, how, what does Paul say? Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If you don't believe God is going to repay, you've got to take justice in your own hands, right? If you don't believe God is fully and finally going to deal with sin, you've got to go get it for yourself. And that's why when we see ourselves trying to go get our own justice, even if it means sinful anger, we need to be thinking, oh, wait, 
there's a breakdown in belief. There's a breakdown here when I think I need to slander someone or I need to cut them out, right? And then I apply love. Okay, so this is the lens through which we're actively working in the gospel. Now, here's the two pit stops. We're gonna take two pit stops with our final 10 minutes. And these are the two sides of the coin. When I see this breakdown, all right, I need to embrace the gift of repentance, all right? And repentance, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just fly over this real quick, but I want you to know, everybody in, in this video chat needs to know this. Repentance is a gift, it's not a cuss word, right? First John 1 says that if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar and his truth is not in us, right? But then it says, if we confess our sins, we, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The most dangerous thing you can do is try to avoid repentance, try to avoid, see, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Okay, the, 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 the most dangerous thing you and I can do when we see these symptoms of unbelief, we see these symptoms of false hopes, when we see this breakdown in love is to run from it or force someone to put a line in the sand. And if you're still dealing in, in terms of transgression, let me offer you the hope of the gospel. There's no condemnation in Christ, so you don't have to only confess sin when there's a clear verse that says this is wrong, and I, and now you've crossed over that line. You can embrace the fact that sin, that, that a, a lack of trust in God and a disobedience with his desires, it, it goes way deeper than you expected. It's more, it's got more heads sprouting up than you ever thought. It's like the dandelions in your yard. You pull one and there's two more. Okay, you knew you needed a savior. Don't run from that, run towards it, okay? because it's a gift to get rid of what's deadly, disgusting, dishonoring to God, destructive to your marriage. So run towards really, you know, I, I think I, I don't know if I, no, it wasn't you. I texted a church member uh, last week and I said, hey, I, I don't know if I can put an exact pin on where I went wrong, but the Holy Spirit convicted me about what I said to you. And I'm sure there was some self-interest in there at the expense of another person. And so I just want you to know that I felt it and I felt convicted and I need to apologize to you. And it was just, it was something the, the honestly, the Holy Spirit brought to mind when I was praying one morning. And it, it's not like there's always things that we don't see, but when God brings them to mind, I want to run towards those things because there's no condemnation. There's no threat of me being punished again. Jesus paid it all, right? So here's the other thing though, in repentance. Sometimes we do this with, uh, with, with repentance. The second thing is it's a, we do the bucket of tears, okay? And the bucket of tears is a false gospel that I really want to carefully um, uh, kill. You might stay away from repentance because you're scared of being condemned again. Well, Jesus paid it all. Look at the cross, rejoice, and turn away from sin. But there's this orphan bargain that I call the buff bucket of tears that's a de deadly, dangerous go false gospel as well. It's this, where we come to God and we say, I am sorry I repent of my sin, and then we do, what do you want me to do now to make up for it? Okay, how many of you have been there? You don't have to raise your hands, but our hearts run to that false gospel. I'm sorry I did this, God. I'm going to do better next time, or I'm going to do more good. I'm gonna stop doing the bad, or I'm gonna do more good. What, why is that a false gospel? Because what's the resume that we're sliding across the table in the midst of our repentance. Is it Jesus' death and his righteousness in our place? It's I will do gooder, right? And this bucket of tears, repentance is a dangerous thing. Don't make that orphan bargain that, it says, that says, hey, if I do better, you won't evict me, right, Father? Well, that's not the way the Heavenly Father looks at you, and that's not the way believers repent. We don't slobber all over ourselves and cry our eyes dry, trying to prove to God that we are worthy to be forgiven. We're not worthy to be forgiven, but Jesus has won forgiveness for us. And I just want to make sure you see that because you see it sometimes in your marriage. There was a bunch of times before I, um, before I really owned or dealing with my anger, there was a lot of the, the big reactions and all the, the drama 
instead of just the saying, okay, that's really who I am. I've got to own it, but I've got to turn away from it. Like, this is a true statement about me. This anger is showing. Instead of saying, how could I have done that? I can't believe I did that. I'm so deeply sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Making excuses and making a show. Those are those two sides. Running from confessing and then like over confessing in a way that's kind of like atoning for your own sin. You do this in your marriage. Instead of saying, nope, that, that, that's the wicked heart that I still nurture at times. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to rest in Christ to, to, to by his spirit, work, work new in me. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't say, I'm going to try and be better, babe, or whatever. But there's, you might feel that tension as you think about it, that you're like, wow, there's a lot of me that wants to slide across a bargain of why I'm worthy to be forgiven. That's dangerous, okay? Um, here's eight A's. I think I put them in your notes. Actually, I'll just let you read them. They're good for confession. Uh, they're from Ken Sand. So basically, Ken Sand has written all these different conflict resolution books, peacemaking books. If you, you know, he's printed the same material with, with peacemaking for kids, peacemaking for family, conflict resolution at work. No slight to Ken Sand, but you, you pick up any one of those, you probably find most of the things I'm referencing. Okay. So um, now, though, the next thing is applying the gospel to your spouse. And this is where sometimes because you're one flesh, it's in your vested interest, you love your, your spouse, to say, I see a breakdown in belief or in hope or in love, and I want to help you trust Christ more deeply. And um, the first thing I would say is this, overlooking should be your active first step. There's a list of scriptures that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple of them. Proverbs 19 is the first one. Abby, can you look up Proverbs 17 while I do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Proverbs 19, I can copy it in my notes and it's going to bite me. 19 verse 11, it says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is one's glory to overlook an offense. Abby's going to read Proverbs 17, 4. 14. Uh, 14, excuse me, 17, 14. Um, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. And, and Jesus says, settle a matter quickly with your adversary on the way while they're taking you to court. Otherwise, right, that's the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And Ephesians 4, 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. There are all these passages that talk about the beauty, wisdom, and honor of deciding not to pursue conviction and confrontation. And depending, some of you may need to hear that. Okay, that's where, uh, that's what I need to hear. My my disposition is to go after and to confront and, okay, you guys are gonna, you can pray for Abby, okay? There was literally this weekend a time where I think you'd say you were sinning, right? Yeah, I'm sure, I don't know what well, you're talking about. Well, let's see if you remember this. I stood directly in her face and said, I am not going to move because it's in your best interest that I call out this sin clearly. Not physically move. I just meant on the position. But that's my disposition. And that's my disposition. Okay, now you guys are like, whoa. But like, we've had conversations like, like that. And I usually need to be told, okay, it'd probably be good for you to overlook this one. Now, I, I think what you're walking yeah, through, it was a good confrontation. I just came back and repented because I wasn't gentle. All right, that's where I, a place where I need to grow. Is I was like, you know what? I don't think that was gentle. But... Some of you need to hear it's good to overlook a matter. And then you need to think, okay, Jesus' words are in, in the second thing you'd be saying is, if I'm going to choose to overlook, I'm not going to choose to overlook, here's my next first step. All right? And that's Matthew 7, 3 through 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? All right, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see, see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This passage, I mean, I'm telling you, I don't think there's a more practical uh, passage for a marriage or for a lot of relationships in the church. Your own sin is the biggest threat to your marriage. Do you realize that? As a pastor, one of the things I have to often tell myself is this. God, I, I pray this regularly. God, please help me to never be more grieved about someone else's sin than my own, okay? So let's say I met somebody who's, you know, pursuing an adulterous relationship. There's, it's easy for me to feel like, 
gripped in heart about their sin, right? But guess what? Here's, here's just a practical reality. Their sin isn't going to kill me. Only my sin is going to kill me. And my sin wants to tell me, well, at least you're not like that guy, right? But my sin will actually kill me. And in your marriage, this happens all the time. Well, Abby's 95% of the problem. And I let my 5% that'll kill me slip by. But you know what I found? Was that the more I started to focus on my 5%, it expanded. It was wild. I actually was 95% of the problem, okay? And that's, that is the way that our sin wants to deceive us, right? So we, we make our sin the biggest threat to ourselves and our marriage. And then we pause and we say, okay, am I seeing clearly? And this is where I, wanna, I want you to remember this. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And this is a, it's a, a psychological term, but it's, it's a really biblical, I think, idea, being considerate of love and, and considerate of others. And fundamental attribution error is this idea that we often give to get, uh, put false motives and character flaws on the other person when they fail or do something to us that we would excuse in our own circumstances as pressure or circumstances, right? So when somebody cuts me off on the road, they're a donkey, right? But I, when I cut somebody off on the road, am in a hurry, right? There's, I got to get somewhere. When I, uh, when I lose my temper, it's because I've been under a lot of pressure lately, but that other person is an angry, you know, volcano. We attribute it to their character and to false motives or, or, or evil motives, I should say, instead of giving them context the way we give ourselves. So actually, Abby thought yeah, of an illustration. I, I was thinking um, about it in line with when we first got married, we, I would always have David like try to look at the car or look at something in the house. I'd always say like, hey, can you just, the car's making a weird noise. Can you look at it? I'm like laying under the car, you know, trying to think how my mechanic fix it or something in the house. And for a long time, probably a couple of years, we would get into these like heated arguments about it. And I felt like he wasn't showing love to me because he wasn't fixing things. Like he didn't care that the car wasn't working. He just was going to let it break because he didn't care. He obviously didn't care about me because he wasn't taking any time to fix it or even think about it. When in reality, it was nothing like that. He just didn't know how to fix the car. Like that wasn't any way that he thought like, I'm not going to show her love. His dad never fixed the cars. It was just, something that I was completely misreading as him saying, I don't love you. I don't care about you in a stupid way. Like it's a really, you know, minute example of it. But I was thinking that when it was really something simple of, he didn't know how. So I think once I processed that and thought, he's not doing this on purpose to get at me, or he's showing love in all these other areas. This one area shouldn't be so blaring to me glaring to me uh it was really helpful to just think through and process that out loud together I yeah because i mean sometimes we don't even recognize the expectations we have because i the other layer to that for me was uh the family i grew up in uh that like i was kind of doing what my dad did my dad worked a ton of hours and my grandfather was retired from the time i was born and so he was really handy and he would come over and fix stuff and my mom would do a bunch of that stuff so that we my dad could work a lot at the church and I was looking at it like, like why this is an illegitimate expectation, and why are you also assuming that I know how to do all this crap? And even though I have such a wonderful mechanic look right now, right? Um, it was a, it was a, a great moment for her to wait, check. Okay, I've attributed laziness or ill will, disdain to my husband when actually it's some circumstances that would give context of. Same thing for me, like I'll, I would put expectations on, you guys have all done this, I'm sure. You put expectations on someone and when they fail, you thought that they were trying to get at you or that they were just a bad kind of person. And you failed in the same way, and except for you said, I understand the context, okay? So um, now here's when you should confront, and we're gonna get done with this quick, okay? When you should confront, is when I, the, the four points I put is a spouse is hurting your relationship, a spouse is hurting other people, a spouse is hurting themselves, a spouse is dishonoring God. I'd say the lens of love, if it's in their best interest or others' best interest, 
that you confront this. Now, I didn't add this word because I didn't want to get too bogged down in it, but I would say repeatedly or significantly are the words you should think of. Repeatedly or significantly. If you see a, a place where this is time and again damaging X relationship or in a dramatic fashion damaging X relationship, well, it's loving for you to confront that, right? And, and uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, a lot of people who never take up the love of confrontation. The way they'd say it in the business world or like in, in a workforce is, it's like there, there are bosses who've never confronted someone who keeps failing. And, and I love when there's this author I read who, who will say, listen, just, just make sure you're clear about it. You're silent about their failure for you, not for them. It feels like you want to be quiet sometimes when you see your spouse struggling in sin or breaking a relationship. Let's say Abby's relationship with her mom's great, but let's say she had a breakdown in a relationship with her mom because of sin that continually there was this resentment and conflict and whatever. And I'm just watching it. And I'm just watching it build steam and grow mold and, and ruin that relationship. I might keep quiet. Maybe if I had a different disposition or something, disposition or something but I might say something about it only subtly or passive aggressively or not at all because of me, because I love me. Not because it's going to give life to my wife, because sometimes we can give life by removing what's deadly, right? By helping in that, okay? Um, on the other side, let's say that you're seeing, your, and, and here's the thing, you don't confront your spouse, but you see some trouble. I would like to uh, postpone for another day the talk on forgiveness, but I want to say this. Forgiveness is is really, really an important piece of the Christian life that I'd encourage you to be doing some reading on, but I'll give you one framework from the scripture that I think is really helpful, and it is, uh, so sometimes we think about forgiveness, we're required to be forgivers, because we're, that's what the scripture tells us, if we don't forgive, God will forgive us, not as a quid pro quo, but because it shows his character in us, right? Well, sometimes people go, how do I forgive somebody who's not repentant, right? Well, I think that one of the helpful things, I'll just put that fire out real quick, is to think of Jesus on the cross. There are two different pieces of forgiveness. Forgiveness is this heart disposition of being willing to bear the weight of someone else's sinful choices. But reconciliation is a different piece that involves a two-way street of, of forgiveness being offered and repentance being in, in turning back, right? So the people who were crucifying Jesus, Jesus calls out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But they, in their unrepentant state, did not receive any kind of forgiveness from him. In fact, the apostles condemned them for having crucified the Lord of glory, right? Well, if you can, if, if sometimes we think we merge forgiveness and reconciliation and we say, well, if I'm going to forgive someone, that means my abuser, I just have to let them come back into my house or I have to do these things. And I think that there's a lot of unhelpful muck that gets in there. There's a heart disposition that says, I will bear the weight of your wrongdoing, not forcing you to bear the weight of it, right? And the way you can do that is because you pass it to Jesus, right? He, bear, he bore your wrongdoing, and he can bear the weight of their wrongdoing. If you are resting in the cross, then you have someone to pass it. Not that you can actually be the Savior who bears the weight of their sin. You just, you lean into him, and he carries the weight of both those sins, right? But that doesn't always mean reconciliation, because there, there needs to be repentance so that wrongs are made right. That is something that I'm just going to, for frankly, I shouldn't, I say every week, I should have named it 40 Minutes of Marriage, but I'm going to close here. Here's the thing I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take your little gospel map, okay? And I would like you to think about a place where recently you've seen sin or struggle, and I want you to work through the points and say, okay, what was I failing to believe or where was I putting my hopes? What was the breakdown in love? And trace it out and then get to the point where you say, okay, now how does Jesus present a true and better way of seeing the world? The way of life you learned in Christ and the truth that was taught in Jesus, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. Unpack that in a specific moment. I was doing this. It displayed this desire and here's how Christ and his work and his promises gives me a better way of seeing the world that frees my hands from having to do X, Y, or Z that is sinful because I trust him, right? If you need coaching on that, 
Um, I'm not gonna lie. I have taught a lot of the premarital counseling of the other weeks and this stuff I kind of, I wanted to stop and unpack a little more for you all. So it's the first time that I've walked through this. I'd love to help with that more, but I'm gonna call it a day here for now. So thank you for being with us. We love you guys. I'm praying that this is helpful and fruitful.